So what we're looking at today, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to do this review with, actually, yeah, I am going to do this with you guys. Yeah, yeah, because I there's we didn't go through this example last time. Uh, just do let's let's take a quick look at reviewing one problem where we're simplifying square roots, and then we're going to look at using this this skill that we've been practicing to solve some quadratic equations. So let's start off with this one. Let me everybody click and close. Get your focus up here, please. All right, how are we going to do this? And earbuds and all that stuff. Get rid of all that, please. How are we going to do this? We got to simplify this the square root of this fraction. Multiply top and bottom by square root of 320. Was that the suggestion? It, we could, but that's going to give us huge numbers. Let, let's, let's take a different route and see if we can get some smaller, easier numbers to deal with. And when we're simplifying, we're really just using PEMDAS. Right. We're just now let's try to make that connection, though. Let's try to connect our regular order of operations, PEMDAS, to a problem like this, because this is a little different than what you've looked at in the past. Right. So what's the first step to simplifying using PEMDAS? Parentheses. And, and by parentheses, we mean parentheses or what? I mean, OK, okay so exponents would be the second one. But within that parentheses, Okay, any kind of grouping symbols, right? Anything that groups stuff together counts as parentheses. Well, we don't see any grouping symbols of any kind here, but to group just means to, you know, to gather together, right? Anytime we have stuff that's inside of some function, it's grouped inside of that function. So if we focus on this first step up here, the parentheses step, there aren't parentheses, but wouldn't you agree that all that stuff is grouped inside of the square root. Everybody see that? Okay, so then the first step is we want to ask ourselves, can we simplify the stuff that's inside of the square root? Can we reduce that fraction? What could we divide both top and bottom numbers by? Two, sure. So we could rewrite this as the square root of... 189 divided by 160. And we're kind of stuck there. We can't reduce it anymore, can we? This is odd. This is even. That's divisible by 3. This is not. Uh, this is not divisible by 4. So I think we're stuck with, with what we got. So what's next? What's next here? We've got a square root of a fraction that we can't reduce anymore. What do you think? Suggestion? Say it again. Okay, so we can, well, we do have an exponent, the expo and that's a weird one. How are there exponents in here? I, I, the square root. I'm not going to tell you why right now. We'll get to that later, but radicals count as exponents, okay? So we got to simplify uh, any radicals that we've got there. But right now it's written as one square root. Could we make it a little bit easier? Remember this property a couple days ago? What do you think? What could I do to that to make it simpler? I've got a square root of a fraction. I can split that up into two separate smaller square roots. That makes it a lot better, doesn't it? But I agree, so we could rewrite this. If I use this property, we could rewrite this as the square root of 189 divided by the square root of 160. Now that looks better. We, each of those individually we can handle. That's the stuff we've been practicing, right? Okay, so now we've just got to simplify each of those exponents, which means the, you know, the square roots. What about the square root of 189? How am I going to simplify the square root of 189. My goal when I simplify a, a square root, remember, is to get as much outside of the radical as possible. So what was my process I went through to do that? How did I do that? Factor, yeah, we're gonna factor 189. And remember that our the saying that we're gonna pay attention to here 
is couples go out, singles stay in, right? So we got to see if we have, you know, when we factor this thing, we got to locate the couples and the singles, and that tells us which parts of that number end up outside and which parts end up inside, right? So let's do that. One eighty nine. Say it again. We can do that. We can do three and sixty three. It's fine. Uh, that works just fine. Is there another suggestion? Nine. nine. Okay, I like nine better than three. How come I like nine better than three? Say it again. The, one more time. The last digit is a nine. The last. Okay. Well, the last digit's a nine. Okay. If we add these things up. 1 plus 8 plus 9, that's 18. So we know it's divisible by 9. 9 is a better factor for us than 3 if we're trying to do couples go out, singles stay in. Look what happened. What's this 9 going to break down to? Ah, a couple of 3s. 9 is good because it's a perfect square, right? 9 is 3 squared. So we always want to look for, if possible, we'd like, to, we'd like to pick perfect square factors. Do we have to do it that way? No. It's not that big a deal, but I'm just trying to give you the, some hints about the easiest way to do this stuff. So 9 into 189. 9 goes into 18 twice, and it goes into 9 once. So I get 9 and 21. Okay. Well, the 9 is going to break down, uh, we already said, into a 3 and a 3, and the 21 would just be a 3 and a 7, right? So then couples go out. So let's identify the couples. We'll circle couples. There's a couple. Right, so couples go out of the radical. So we get a three outside, and then inside, yeah, we get a three times a seven, right? Okay, just a quick other little shortcut here. Did I really need to break that 21 down? I mean, I could have probably anticipated that there's, I'm not gonna get any, any couples when I break down the 21, right? So we could have probably just left it as a 21 inside the radical. The more you do this stuff, the more you kind of just see these little shortcuts. What about the 160? Let's take care of that one. Everybody agree that's just going to be 16 and 10? Okay. 16 is good, right? 16 gives us a couple of fours. What about the 10? Am I going to get any singles out of the 10? No sense even breaking it down further then, right? We're going to end up with couple of fours, so I get a four outside, and inside, I'm going to get a two and a five, which I'm just going to make into a 10 anyway, right? So then, where are we now? So we've got, on the top, we've got three times the square root of 21. On the bottom, we've got four times the square root of 10. So far, so good. Okay, there's really no other PEMDAS stuff for us to do. We kind of just get stuck on exponents there. Uh, but am I done? What? Something's not right about this. Oh, yeah, no tenths in the basement, right? We can't have a square root on the bottom. So that's the red flag. We've got this square root of 10 stuck on the bottom. How do we undo that? What's our strategy for undoing? I have a stranded radical. When I say stranded, it's stuck on the bottom. Okay, and I got to multiply just the bottom and the top. Good, got to multiply top and bottom by whatever the stranded radical is. And what is the square root of 10 times the square root of 10? 10, right? How come? We well, can think of it two ways, right? We could either say the square root of 10 times the square root of 10 is the square root of 100. And what's the square root of 100? 10. So we get 10. A better way would just be to say the square root of 10 times the square root of 10. That's just the square root of 10 squared, isn't it? Right? If I multiply something by itself, it's it's just squaring it, and that cancels the squared, and I just get a 10. That's probably a better way to think about it. Okay. Comment, question. Yeah. 
You're right. You're right. That's okay. And there, the cat's out of the bag. That's why it's an exponent. Uh, because you guys brought this up, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why it counts as an exponent. The square root of something, like the square root of a, I can write as a to the one half. Okay. While we're at it, a cube root of a is a to the one third. What do you think the fourth root of a is written as? a to the one-fourth. Okay, so yeah, you can always write any, any radical, you can always write as a, as a fractional exponent. Okay, and that's why it counts as an exponent. Okay. All right, so then uh, we get a 10 out of this, right? So this whole thing multiplies to a 10. And now we can just multiply straight across. On the bottom, I get four times... I multiply things in pairs. So I multiplied this pair first and got a 10. Now I'll take that answer and multiply it by four. So there's the next pair I'm multiplying. I get 40 on the bottom, on the top. Let's multiply these first. What's the square root of 21 times the square root of 10? The square root of 210, right? So those combine into the square root of 210, and then I've got three times that, and that's what I'm stuck with. There's my answer. Oops, come on. Good? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. How are we doing on this? Okay. All right. Some, I get it. We need a little more practice. That's what that assignment's going to be for. I'd like to get you going on that, even this period, if I can, so I can get, answer some questions if you have any. Uh, okay, next issue is, how do we use this to our advantage? Well, when we're solving quadratic equations, we kind of talked about this a little bit on Monday. How do we use this to our advantage? Well, when we're solving quadratic equations, if I can point to a single x, then I can always isolate it by using inverse operations, right? So here's an example of that that we're looking at, right? We know that when solving a quadratic function, linear or quadratic function, if you can point to a single variable, you can always isolate it by reversing PEMDAS and using in inverse operations. So let's look at this example right here. I can point to a single x, it's right there. So what would my, if I use inverse operations, what would the steps be to get that x by itself? What do I do first? Everybody agree I subtract 44 from both sides? Good, okay. Good stuff. So first step is going to be 4x squared equals 30, 436 minus 4, that's 392. What's next? Okay, divide by 4, right? I'm just working my way up PEMDAS, inverse operations. So we divide both sides by 4 and we get x squared equals 98. Now what? Ah, okay, so now we get to e and we have to square root both sides, right? That's how we undo the exponent, okay? Now let's, let's, let's take an easier example for just a second. We'll get back to the 98 one. Okay, let, let's take a really simple one. What if I gave you this equation, x squared equals four? What's the solution? Okay. And, and negative 2, right? Agreed? We're trying to find all the values of x that make that true. If I square a positive, I get a positive. But if I square a negative, I get a positive also, don't I? Right? So I really need to get somehow a plus or minus 2 there. Where does it come from? Here's where it comes from. If I square root both sides, here's the missing step that nobody ever shows you. The square root of x squared equals 2 if I square root both sides. But what in the heck is the square root of x squared equal to? It's not x. I'll prove it to you. Let's make a function here. f of x equals the square root of x squared. And let's evaluate this function at 2. If I evaluate it at 2, I get the square root of 2 squared, the square root of 4, is 2, okay? So if I input a positive, I output the same positive, right? If I input a negative, 
I'm going to get the square root of negative 2 squared. What's negative 2 squared? It's 4. Square root of 4 is 2. If I input a negative, it gives me the positive out. What function do we know that does that? If I input a positive, it leaves it alone. If I input a negative, it makes it positive. Absolute value. Yeah, there's the answer. The, the square root of x squared is actually equal to the absolute value of x. Okay, so this, we get the equation, the absolute value of x equals 2. Think back to when we solved absolute value equations. If I have an isolated absolute value equals something, then what was inside either equaled the positive or the negative, right? There you go. Okay, do we have to show that step? No, you don't. You can just skip ahead. You know that if you are square rooting both sides of an equation, I've got to add that plus or minus. You don't have to show these steps, but you have to include the plus or minus. Okay, so let's go back up to our problem. So we're going to square root both sides, right? That's going to give us x equals, what do I have to include? Plus or minus. Good, I have to include the plus or minus because anytime I'm square rooting both sides of an equation, that has to happen. And then I just have to simplify the square root of 98. Well, let's look at that. If I take 98, that just breaks up into... 49 times 2. 49 is good. How come? Perfect square. I'm getting a couple of 7s out of that, right? So I get plus or minus 7 times the square root of 2. There's my two solutions. One for plus, one for minus. Okay, make sense? Okay, so you see why we practice these square roots. Okay, let's do the one we did yesterday. Or a couple days ago, we started this one. And you, you did most of it, right? You told me, add 5 to both sides. That's correct. So those cancel. I get the quantity 3x minus 4 squared equals 81. Now what? Square root. Okay, I'm going to square root both sides. So that's going to give me 3x minus 4 equals, what's the first thing I write down? Plus or minus. And then the square root of 81 is, okay, good. Now, what are the last two steps in order to isolate that x? Okay, I'm going to add 4, right? So what about the adding 4 step? Let's look at that. I'm going to add 4, and here's my little suggestion, my little hint. There's a couple ways we could go with this. This is really two different equations, isn't it? We've got the equations 3x minus 4, gosh, this darn pen, equals 9, or 3x minus 4 equals negative 9. Uh, we're gonna get, right, you're going to get two different answers. I could write these two equations down and solve them separately, but I could save a little time if I just do this. It's a good little trick. Whatever number I'm adding to both sides, put it in front of the plus or minus. So we're going to add the 4 in front of the plus or minus, and then look what we got. 3x equals 4 plus or minus 9. That looks weird, but I've got two answers in one there. Next step you told me was divide by 3. So if I divide each side through by 3, there's my solution, right? x equals 4 plus or minus 9. Now all I have to do, instead of writing down the two equations separately, I can just... Simplify these expressions when I include the plus sign and the minus sign separately, and I can do it in my head. 4 plus 9 is what? 13. There's one solution. X equals 13 thirds. Or if I take the minus, I get X equals 4 minus 9. That's negative 5 over 3. See what I'm saying? Easy. As long as you put the number in front of the plus or minus, it's really easy to just use the plus once, use the minus at the, another time at the very end, and write down my two solutions with only having to write the algebra steps once instead of twice. Okay? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. How are we doing here? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. So what's different about this one? 
okay, the, the instructions say find all x-intercepts. So we, gotta, we have to think about how our goal here now is to take this problem and see if we can write it as an equation. What does it mean to be an x-intercept? Now, what's going on with that? When we say find all x-intercepts, what's unique about x-intercepts? What's important about them? It's where the function crosses the x-axis, right? What's the y value at all x-intercepts? Zero. There you go. So x-intercepts occur where y equals zero and y is just a, another name for f of x, right? So all we have to do to turn that into an equation is set the right side equal to zero. Boom, there you go, right? So we end up with the equation two times the quantity x minus five squared minus seven equals zero, right? Okay, so first step, add seven. We can isolate the x, can't we? There's a single x we can point to so we can isolate it. So we add seven. So step one, two times x minus five squared equals seven. Now what? Divide by two. So step two, we've got x minus five equals seven halves. Step three, root it. Okay, so we get step three, x minus five equals, okay, but, Plus or minus. First thing, you don't forget that. That's the first thing I, I, I want to hear is plus or minus the square root of 7 halves. Well, we got to simplify that, okay? 7 halves can't be reduced. So what do I, what's the first thing I probably want to do here? Okay, good. Split it. Separate square roots, top and bottom. So we get plus or minus... The square root of 7 over the square root of 2. And, okay, but what, what's the last thing I got to do here? Okay, good. No tents in the basement, right? So we've got to multiply top and bottom by the square root of 2. And that gives us a 2 on the bottom, which is great. Then we end up with plus or minus square root of 7 times square root of 2 is what? Square root of 14, good. Okay, that's good. So finally, we simplified that radical. We've got x minus 5 equals that. Last step, add 5. Right there. Okay, and our answers look like x equals 5 plus or minus square root of 14 over 2. And that's actually both of my solutions. Because when I, when I add this symbol, it means plus or minus. There's two for one deal, right? Okay. I could write them separately if I wanted to. Okay. But what do you know? We actually get, if I were to turn those into decimals, 5 plus the square root of 14 over 2, I guarantee is 6.871, blah, blah, blah. Okay. 5 minus the square root of 14 over 2 is going to be that decimal. Shows up on the graph as two x-intercepts. Okay? Give me thumbs. Okay? Okay. How about this one? Find all the x-intercepts. Same deal. I'm setting it equal to zero and solving, right? Okay? No biggie. So I get minus 4 times the quantity x minus 1 squared uh, equals, well, let's not do it that way. Skipping steps. I don't want to be skipping steps. Minus 16 equals zero, right? So add 16. Agreed? Divide by negative 4, right? And I get x minus 1 squared equals negative 4. Now what? Square root it. Okay. So we'll square root both sides. What's bad about that? Yeah, I got a negative under the radical, right? Under the square root. Remember, there's two things we said several times earlier in the year we can't do. We can't divide by 0 with real numbers. 
and we can't take a square root of a negative number. So the answer right now is we can already see no real solutions. So what do you think? Are we going to get x-intercepts? No, we're not. Look at the graph. There's no x-intercepts. Okay? Make sense? Okay? All right. Okay. All right. Okay, last one. Let's just do one more together here, and then I'm going to let you guys work. What's the first step here? Subtract 10. Okay, good. And I think you folks are getting the hang of this. So we get minus 2 times the quantity 2x plus 3 squared equals negative 196. Now what? Okay. Okay, so we get two, the, the quantity 2x plus 3 squared equals negative divided by negative is positive. So I get positive 98. Square root it. Okay, we'll take our 98, and that breaks up into 49 and 2, which is good, right? Get a couple of 7s, single 2, agreed? So when I square root this then, Plus or minus, and I'm going to get my 7 times the square root of 2. Okay, couples go out, singles stay in. And what's next? Okay, where am I going to put it? Okay, good. So we're going to get, good. Last step. Divide by 2, okay? So when we divide by 2, let's talk about this last step for just a second. And then we're, I'm going to let you go on this. When I divide by 2, I'm going to get x equals all this stuff divided by 2, right? That's okay to leave it that way. I think it's better personally to split this up. And the reason I think it's better is because, like, what if this were a negative 4 right there? I, I can't I can't simplify anything here. I can't reduce, but I could there. You see my point? Right now, we're, we're, we can't really simplify no matter what. If I split this up, I've got a common denominator. Let's split it. I get negative 3 over 2 plus or minus 7 times the square root of 2 over 2, and we're stuck. But what if my answer had been, hypothetically, what if we had had something like x equals negative 4 plus or minus... 7 times the square root of 2 over 2. When I split that up, I get negative 4 over 2 plus or minus 7 times the square root of 2 over 2, and negative 4 over 2 reduces. So when you split it up, sometimes you can reduce one more than the other. You see what I'm saying? And so we end up with x equals negative 2 plus or minus 7 times the square root of 2 over 2. So I think it's better to split them up. You good? Go. You can work.